But uh, either way, they're some interesting ideas to me, and it's fun to talk about things that I'm interested in. So let's go ahead and get started. My name is uh, Nader Dabit. I'm a developer relations engineer at Edge and Node, and Edge and Node is a company that's in the DeFi, Web3, blockchain space. And our main focus is kind of like supporting companies, de uh, developers, protocols, or, and builders that are kind of building out what we think is the future of the internet, the decentralized web, also often referred to as Web3. Um, and my talk is called How to Build a DAP. And in order for me to kind of show you how to build a DAP, I want to walk through a few different areas, not only in the actual building process, but I also want to talk about what it is that we're building and why we're building this stuff. So that means I need to talk about the architecture stuff, the web infrastructure stuff, but also the theoretical stuff and things around the ideas of like what Web3 is. So we're going to be covering all that stuff today. Um, it's going to be a quick you know, overview slideshow of about 20 minutes, and then I want to actually build a dApp from scratch. So what is a dApp? Dapp is D-app, so decentralized app. And we're going to talk about, again, like what all this stuff means. What is a decentralized app? Well, essentially, it's a Web3 app. And by the end of this talk, you'll understand what that means. So before we do that, let's talk about Web3. Most commonly, you know, people throw around this term when they're talking about the decentralized web. And I want to kind of walk through why this term even exists. So at first, when we kind of created the internet, not, not we, but other people, um, it was built in a certain way that is a lot different than it is today. So uh, commonly people are kind of categorizing the web, revol uh, evolution of the web in three separate categories, web one, web two, and web three. So web one is kind of like referred to as the early um, edition of the internet. And this was kind of like from when the internet was first created until maybe um, 2000 and, um, you know, four or so, something like that. And the, the web 1.0 was like a read only web. It wasn't a web that the average person could participate in, in any way other than a consumer. If you wanted to build something, if you wanted to create something, you had to be a developer. You couldn't just be the average person like we are today, creating TikTok videos and all these other things. In 2004-ish, um, we started seeing these types of applications that allowed for um, a very elegant solutions for user-generated content. So we started seeing wikis coming around. We started seeing social networks coming around. We started seeing applications like Facebook, um, Instagram. People started being able to build out their own platforms without having to be developers. And Web2 was awesome. It's grown and it's changed the world. But there are some limitations and therefore, a lot of smart people, a lot of computer scientists, a lot of people that have kind of, you know, always been developers and that are passionate about improving things have created new ways to build applications. And they're starting to categorize all this stuff into a category known as Web3. Now, when the original internet existed, the reason that it's become so successful uh, to many people is that we have built-in web protocols that all of us can use. So when you think of things like, you know, creating a website and uh, being a developer and interacting with that website, we're using protocols every day. And these are protocols that are consistent across the entire world. Anyone that is accessing my website via HTTP is going to be able to do it without any centralized intermediary. Um, we use things like TCP, FTP, uh, SSH. All of these protocols are things that we know and use every day. But there are a couple of pieces of key functionality that were not included in the early internet. These were native payments and native state. In order to get around this, basically what we've done in the meantime is we've created some of the most complex and brittle systems in the entire world. So when you think about native payments, what do you need to do for someone that turns 18 living in the United States to send money to someone uh, that turned 18 on the same day that lives in South America or in some other part of the world? 
Well, to send payments between these two people, they both have to first go and get an identification card. They then need to go to, get, go to the bank, present that identification, go through an entire process to open a bank account. They need to get money and deposit it into that bank account. They, need, they then need to open an email address and create an email address and then go to PayPal or Stripe or one of these other um, places that, that allow you to send payments. And they then connect their bank account. Anyway, it's a huge huge, overly complex piece of infrastructure that is glued together by many parties to make this work. So what we've basically built out is all this complexity to solve a problem that the internet did not present a solution to. Um, the same thing with state. When you think about state, we're talking about data. Where is our data stored? Well, we have web, uh, we have, um, web servers, of course, that you can run in your home. We have the cloud. But these are all centralized servers that often go down. Um, you know, and if you're not if you're not a really, really good engineer, you're probably going to have downtime. Even if you're the best engineer in the world at AWS, where I worked for over three years, we have outages. So you're not, you know, no one can get around this with centralized uh, solutions. And blockchain technology presents solutions to both native payment and native state. And that's why we're seeing all of this, this crazy stuff happening lately, because people are starting to take advantage of all of these things that have been happening and all these improvements to build out these decentralized applications. So Web3, you could think of it as all of the things that we know and love from Web2, but we now have two additional web protocols that are part of the internet, native payments and native state. So Web3 also brings around a few characteristics that are all quite different than what we had in the past. So these are my like characteristics, I, I guess you could say the things that I like the most about it. But if you read a lot of literature and white papers and talks and all this other stuff, you'll see similar things being shared. So Web3 is decentralized. Um, and you'll hear this idea of decentralization all over the place, not only in the actual web infrastructure, but also in the way that we build companies. We're moving away from this idea where there is five or 10 people that become multi-billionaires. And, and instead, we're thinking about how can we build companies where there's shared ownership between everyone in the company. Um, and that brings us to ownership. Not only do we share ownership of companies, but we also, we also can share ownership of data. When we're building out these types of applications, we're building them on public blockchains. All of this data is accessible, which leads us to a um, internet where front ends can compete on back ends. Apps compete on interfaces for the exact same data. Um, we have nat native digital payments, like I mentioned before. Um, one huge thing that we, that we can now uh, take advantage of with these decentralized uh, data solutions are um, self-sovereign identity. So no longer do we need to OAuth into 1,000 different websites, giving them all of our information and letting them store it in their own databases, um, prone to breaches that we hear about literally every single day. We can now create our own um, profile in a in some type of decentralized network. And then we can just allow other applications to point to that profile. And we control everything that's there. And if we go in and we, we want to change something, we can. Um, and we, if we want to allow something to be viewed, we can. If we want it to be private, we can also do that. Um, and then decentralized, uh, I'm sorry, di distributed, trustless, robust infrastructure, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And I mentioned the public backends. So what does it mean when we talk about distributed, trustless, and robust infrastructure? This goes back to the idea of centralized infrastructure being error-prone and very, very complex. Instead of us having a database that we maintain, you could think of a lot of these decentralized data solutions and blockchains as databases that have 100% uptime forever. Because we're not the one running that infrastructure in a single place. And you think about AWS, where you might have a handful of, uh, of you know, different um, places where you can also replicate that. But blockchains are run in literally thousands or tens of thousands of nodes around the world. And that means that data is always going to be there. That means your app is always going to be up. And one of these protocols that I actually work with in my day-to-day -day job is called the graph protocol. When you think about how we typically build APIs on top of data, we have very optimized solutions for reading, writing, querying data. These databases are built for indexing. Our API layers are, are built for querying the, the index data. Um, when you're building applications on top of blockchains, it's actually a lot different. Uh, data, uh, blockchain data is optimized for writes. So when you, talk, when you hear people talking about blockchains, 
Typically, the innovations are happening on how many transactions per second a database can be written to or a blockchain can be written to. So you think about things like Ethereum, you have 30 to 75 writes per second for now until proof of stake is, is merged with uh, bringing it up to 100,000. Uh, you hear these really innovative blockchain solutions that have 100,000 to like a million writes per second. All the, most, all the smartest people are out there trying to increase this. But what we don't really have is a way to read this data because blockchains by um, nature are basically blocks of information that have been written over time, sometimes years of information. So you can call a blockchain and you can say, hey, I want to get this data from this point in time, but you cannot say, hey, I want to get this relational data. I want to get my friends, friends. I want to kind of like do all these complex things that we're like used to doing in our, our typical applications. So the graph protocol is a decentralized network of nodes that allows developers to upload these subgraph manifest files that then go and index all of this blockchain data and serve it up in a GraphQL API. This is one of the many pieces of Web3 infrastructure that's already out there that's you know, running in a decentralized manner. Uh, Multi-billion dollar companies are using it, multi-billion dollar uh, market cap. So that's kind of like an, an example of maybe a, a data layer. And when I, by data layer, I'm talking about on-chain data. We also have off-chain data. So to write to a, to a blockchain, you have to have to pay for some transaction. Um, and the reason that that's the case is that you want to have some a uh, few different mechanisms around civil resistance. And you also want to make it to like where someone can't just like overload the network and write a million things. So you also need, you know, off-chain storage solutions. So ceramic network is one of these uh, handful of options that are out there. You could think of this as something like a, a typical database, like where you store your, your regular data, but this data is like replicated across uh, different servers. And they also have an identity protocol that allows you to implement the um, decentralized identity that I was talking about before. And they even have another protocol called IDX that allows you to do things like sign in with a uh, blockchain wallet instead of having to pass over your own personal credentials. You can use your uh, wallet address. Um, video streaming. So Live Peer is an example of this. If you want to build something like Twitch, you can do that uh, using these decentralized protocols with Live Peer. IPFS is a very, very popular and widely used file storage um, protocol. And they also have other protocols that are actually built on top of this protocol. So when you think about people talking about NFTs and all this other stuff, a lot of the time, this data is stored in IPFS. Um, Git. So like, what do you do when you start talking about a decentralized version of Git? Git still goes down, right? Well, Radical is a decentralized Git protocol and Radical does not go down or at least, you know, it's still fairly new. So maybe it goes down. But the idea is if, if this project succeeds, it doesn't go down. Um, and then you start thinking about, oops, identity. Um, and identity is a whole mind-blowing talk that could be 10 hours long, but the core to it is instead of saying, hey, I'm going to identify myself with my email address and my phone number, I'm gonna use a, some type of wallet. And this wallet has um, a way for me to identify myself by my address, and this address is generated using public key encryption. So you basically create a wallet, you're given a seed phrase, the seed phrase generates a private key, and then the private key generates a public key. And your public key is your address, and if you wanna learn more about it, check it out. But I also think that the future of social networks is probably gonna be built on one of these wallets because it is a natural place, I think, after kind of like being in this space for a while, because all of the people participating in these different um, projects all have wallets and they all have information that can be identified you know, through your wallet and you can make connections and follow other people and things like that. Um, in fact, Mark Daglius, one of the, the, actually the creator of CSS modules, just left uh, whatever project he was working on to go work for Rainbow. A lot of engineers are leaving to go work in Web3. Um, so what are the benefits and repercussions of this? Well, um, I talked about ownership, so let's talk about that a little more deeply. And I wanna try to get through this quickly because I still wanna do a live demo. Let's talk about gaming. Um, when you think about a, a game like Fortnite, this was revolutionary you know, uh, in a lot of different ways. It was free, but it also allowed um, people to buy skins and, and therefore it seemed free. But in reality, if you have children, you probably spent $1,000 uh, on their skins and their V-Bucks. Skins and V-Bucks are currency within the game. The only problem is that all of this money stays inside the game. When someone creates 
a Fortnite account, they attach their uh, credit card and they start buying skins and they start buying V-Bucks. 10 years later, they grow out of it. They've given $5,000 to the platform. Nothing has come out of it other than fun, which is fine. But what if we can do better? I think we can do better. And we're already seeing new ways of bringing um, Web3 and ownership into gaming. One of the examples that is most interesting to me is this game called Axie Infinity. Axie Infinity is a crypto game. Uh, it's a Web3 game. You can use it, you can play it, and you can actually earn a living off of it. People around the world are actually quitting their jobs to play Axie Infinity full time. The reason that this is they have three different ways to monetize. One is that you earn currency for playing the game, which you can then sell in an open exchange. Also, you can buy different items within the game and you retain the ownership of those items. You can then put those items on a digital marketplace and sell those when you're done. So when you're spending five hours playing the game, instead of wasting five hours, you know, I wouldn't say wasting, you're having a good time. What if you could actually make money? Axie Infinity blew, blew, blew their last uh, numbers of the 30-day period, going from like a, a few million dollars up to $780 million in transactions in the last 30-day period. And they've started seeing tons of really, really high interest, but also a lot of other companies around the world um, and, and venture capital flowing in to build out competitors because they see the value of this. So now instead of the money going directly into the game, the game itself just takes a portion of all the transactions that happen and not, over 95% of the actual money going into the game goes back to the people playing the game. So the money stays within the users of the game and it is a new way of doing things. And recently, the, um, the head of YouTube Gaming um, tweeted this out. He said, I'm bullish on NFTs, and NFTs are kind of the mechanism that makes this happen. I believe that play to earn is the next major, major gaming model, as well as an open liquid market for in-game digital items. Uh, most in-game assets are e-liquid, which is insane to me. All this will change long-term through blockchain and NFTs. It's self-evident. Um, again, uh, I believe that that's the case as well. And then we have this idea of like a new creator economy and equity in social media. So what does that mean? Well, in social media today, the ways that we are doing things as a platform, how do you make money? Well, you exploit your users as much as, as, much as possible. You, you, you watch them, you take their data, you do everything you can to kind of get every little thing out of them. And then all of the money that comes in through that platform goes to the platform. The creators are left to figure out ways to monetize themselves. So what do they do? They write ebooks. They sell diet shakes. Um, advertising is kind of like a key part of this. Advertising brings a very, very negative user experience. When you go to YouTube, you probably spend half of your time watching videos um, that are not videos. They're, adver they're ads. Um, and then there's zero ownership. So like if, if YouTube decides to like somehow you know, delete your account because someone uh, you know, said you did something, you don't really have a lot of like repercussions. And in fact, I've seen YouTubers with millions of followers lose all of their content, all of their videos and all of their followers because someone did something and flagged their, their account or maybe they got hacked, it's done. Their, their, their platform is now gone. Um, social media and, and Web3 is a little different. Um, I kind of have these little, little sayings at the bottom left corner, uh, Web2 gain followers, Web3 follower gains. I kind of like that one. Um, in, in, in Web3 social media, I think that you're gonna see um, what we're already starting to see in, in other parts of, uh, of Web3, the ability for the content owners to monetize their platforms much better, but also the people consuming the content to also find ways to monetize by the time that they've invested. And the way that this is happening is through NFTs and tokenization. A few examples, first of all, this um, really, really talented Japanese uh, JavaScript developer created this NFT collection of 10,000 um, generative pieces of uh, art, you could call it, I guess. He created a smart contract that used p5.js to basically uh, allow someone to mint one of these NFTs. And based on the ID of the NFT, one to 10,000, it automatically generates this design. He created this project in 432 lines of JavaScript. He launched it 
and it sold out in about 15 minutes, making him $3 million, which of all of the money he gave to the generative art community. And on top of that, programmed into the actual future sales of that NFT, 2.5% of every single sale in the future goes back to that wallet address. Meaning that not only did he create $3 million that day, but he created $600,000 in the next week. And then anytime anyone buys or sells one of these, all of that money goes to that, that address and goes back to that community. Um, the people that bought these NFTs can actually retain them and resell them on the open market, or they can just keep them. It's a good way for them to not only invest in people that they believe and they want to support, but it's an, also an investment in, in, in to some people's eyes that they think like one day they might be able to sell this thing. Either way, it's a lot different than me handing over $1,000 as a donation when I'm actually getting something out of it. We may not want to believe that, but in reality, it will change the way that we um, interact with creators. Ownership, um, also pay to play or pay to use. Super Rare is an NFT platform that um, launched a while back. And to use the platform, you use your Ethereum wallet or, or your some type of uh, blockchain wallet to log in. After they started gaining momentum, they created their own token. Their token um, was invested in by venture capitalists and people all around the world with liquidity. And what they decided to do to support all of the people that have been using their platform, they airdropped tokens to every single wallet that ever used their platform. People made anywhere between $5,000 to $120,000 just by using this platform as early adopters. And they plan to do more token drops uh, in the future to the best of my understanding. Um, Board Ape Yacht Club is kind of like more of like an NFT type of deal, but I think the model is really interesting because they've generated over $100 million and they've created intellectual property and a very interesting, really, really, really engaged community of over 20,000 people um, that if they got in early, they now have, you know, um, a couple of hundred thousand dollars in equity uh, often. But what they're now doing with that million dollars is they're now using that to build out additional um, value for the community. They're doing merchandise, they're doing collaborations, they're gonna be doing things like, you know, working with celebrities, all types of stuff. But everyone that owns one of these NFTs is part of that community. And um, I think that in the future, you might see people funding software companies this way, because not only do you see this, like, this thing being a lot better than kissing ass for your VCs for $5 million, why not have $100 million that you don't have to ever give back that, um, that everyone that has invested in you wants to see you succeed. Um, so I think the next web, the next big social media platform will spring, will be for sure Web3 and will spring from a wallet or a digital marketplace. It makes a lot of sense for me in a digital marketplace because you have people that are already there and they're already interacting with creators. So I think that you'll see something like OpenSea or, um, you have Foundation or you have Super Rare. One of these platforms will either be that or someone will create that. Uh, Jack Dorsey is trying to build out a decentralized version of Twitter because he's kind of like seeing where this, all, all this stuff is going. And also the founder of Ave and the sound, founder of uh, SushiSwap, which are two really, really big uh, Web3 projects are also looking at building out these types of uh, platforms. Um, and then the last thing before we do some live coding, which we only have about 10 minutes left, so <laughs> we'll see, um, but we'll, we'll do it, is communities and DAOs. Uh, communities and DAOs are basically the new way of, of building companies, in my opinion. Instead of having money come in from venture capitalists or you having to borrow money or use your own money, instead, um, you want to create a company, you can have an idea, you can basically crowdsource it, you can tokenize it, you have a lot of uh, seed, seed investors, of, you could even call them angel investors, that are invested in making your thing succeed. And you get the money up front and you don't have to go through all of the BS that you had to in the past. And, um, and it kind of like overlaps between the old communities that we've had and companies. So like when you think about DAOs, DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. It's kind of like a, a new way again of like building not only communities and companies, but products. So a couple of examples that are in addition to like the really, really well-known protocols that are out there that are like multi-billion dollar companies that are like a little more interesting to me are these, um, these social tokens. And these are created 
using uh, DAOs and people participating early on in these, these different communities. Uh, one of the ones that I'm part of is Friends with Benefits. It started one year ago uh, to get in. It was like $20 worth of, worth of tokens. Um, a year later, it's now a uh, market cap of $150 million. Every person that is part of the community has at least $20,000 in equity. There's thousands of uh, community members and we can sell our equity at any time on a liquid market. A16Z is now putting in uh, money as well in the last week. And a lot of other investors are doing the same things because they're seeing the value because the communities can create products from the ground up and do it in a more sustainable way. And I would say in a way that um, will be more organic in growth because you don't have to go out there and find people to support you. You have a community of people that already support you, those of which may also be invested. So um, this changes the way that you, uh, you know, do capital and funding, and I kind of already talked about that. So let's get to building, and we have five minutes, and I'm probably going to go over a little bit. So let's see what we can do. When you think of a typical web app, to me, I think about compute, identity, data, storage, and web hosting. The only difference in Web3 is that you do all these things in a decentralized manner, so you try to find protocols that are decentralized that accomplish these tasks. And then you also have the addition of smart contracts, which enable programmable money and programmable state in a decentralized manner. You don't have to create all this complex infrastructure for sending payments. You can actually send a payment in one line of code. So let's go ahead and start uh, building some stuff. Well, actually, let me walk through the client uh, framework. So when you think about, um, or all this stuff, when you think about building an app, you have to think about like these four pieces as kind of like the base layer. You have a client, like a React app, you have a blockchain, you have a client library, which would be something like um, in, the, in the Web2 world, Fetch or Axios. Uh, we have different client libraries in the Web3 space, and then you have a wallet. So the, the main blockchains I'm kind of interested in right now are Ethereum, Avalanche, Solana, Phantom, and Near. They all have their own trade-offs. Um, some are more uh, performant than the others. Some are cheaper than others. There is no clear winner yet. In fact, I think there are going to be multi, multiple blockchains that are used for different things in the future. The, the, these are definitely my most... Uh, favorite ones, but the one we're going to be using today is called uh, Ethereum. And Ethereum runs on something called the Ethereum Virtual Machine, EVM. You could think of it as the JavaScript of the blockchain world, because if you learn the EVM, you can actually write apps on dozens of different blockchains. So you learn once, you write anywhere. You could think of it as like the React or the JavaScript of the blockchain ecosystem. So for this application that we're going to be building, we need to use React for the front end, we want to use Hardhat for the development environment. We want to use Ethers.js for our client library, and we're going to use MetaMask as our wallet. So let's go ahead and get started. And what we want to do is we want to build a application that is the Natter Dabit token, and we want to send that to someone. So here I am in a very basic React application. Um, can everyone see that okay? Okay. So in our React application, we have done nothing, literally. This is a, a bare bones React application other than install a couple of dependencies. So we have our hard hat um, based dependencies and we have ethers and we also have a project called Open Zeppelin Contracts. And Open Zeppelin Contracts can be used to import existing um, smart contracts, similar to how NPM can be used to import uh, libraries. And we're going to use something known as the ERC20 token. The ERC20 token is the same uh, token that's used for, the, for Ethereum itself, but also for other uh, cryptocurrencies out there, a lot of popular ones. And that's the one we're going to use. So to use that, all we have to do is install that, and that's been installed. So you're in your, you're in your React app. You want to start writing a blockchain app. So what do you do? You can actually initialize a new Ethereum of EVM uh, application by running NPX hardhat. And this will actually create an entirely new development environment for you. So here we're going to say, what do you want to do? We want to create a, ba a basic sample project. Notice that all the tooling I'm using is JavaScript. So if you're a JavaScript developer, it should be fairly easy. Uh, the project root, I'm just going to take the default. And now we're good to go. I can go back into my code base. And I see that I have now a folder called contracts that hold my smart contracts. I have a scripts directory that has a script that allows us to deploy our, our project or our uh, smart contract to a blockchain network. I have a test directory that has a test for um, testing out our smart contract code. And I have this hard hat config uh, file that is our configuration. And I'm gonna go ahead and delete some comments to make this really concise. 
So this module that exports, similar to configurations you've probably seen all over the place in uh, any uh, Vue or React or Nuxt or whatever you use, it's just our configuration written in, uh, in JavaScript. So the only thing I need to do to get, to get us started is I want to go ahead and create some project-specific configurations. Since we're in React, you cannot import outside of the SRC directory. So I'm going to go ahead and set a directory called artifacts to be in the SRC directory. The artifacts are what are created as machine-readable code from your smart contract that allows your front end to interact with the back end, which is the blockchain. So when you think of something like GraphQL, you have your GraphQL queries that you might have written in a separate folder. In uh, EVM, you're going to have something called ABIs, Application Binary Interfaces. These are JSON objects that allow you to send HTTP requests to the blockchain. So I have that set up. Now I can go ahead and check out my smart contract. Um, here we have a pretty basic smart contract. This could be thought of as the hello world. And it's very simple. And if you write TypeScript, this will probably make a lot of sense to you, where we have a constructor that takes in a greeting, that sets the greeting. We have a greet function that returns the greeting. And we have a set greeting that resets the state uh, of the greeting. So let's say we want to go ahead and, and deploy and compile this. We can go to our CLI. And let's go ahead and um, run npx hardhat compile. This will compile our smart contract and make it uh, ready for us to not only use locally in our project, but also to deploy to the, to the blockchain. And if I go now back to my project in my SRC directory, I have this artifacts directory. So that worked. The next thing we might want to do would be to test this out by deploying it. So we want to like deploy our smart contract. So we can actually run a local Ethereum node using hardhat with one command, npx hardhat node. And this should go ahead and open an Ethereum node locally and give us 20 different uh, addresses and private keys, each with 10,000 Ethereum in them. So what I can now do is go ahead and say, OK, I want to use this Ethereum wallet and import it into my MetaMask account, which is what we're going to do in just a moment. But for now, let's go ahead and deploy our smart contract. So if I go to my code base, I have a script that I'm going to call deploy.js, which makes a lot more sense than sample script. And let's go ahead and open that script and delete all of the comments. And this will hopefully be fairly concise and clear to you because it's only four lines of code. We have this um, greeter variable, variable that allows us to reference one of the ABIs that we've created earlier when we set our artifacts directory. It knows, it knows to go into the artifacts directory and look for a smart contract called greeter. And we, we get a reference to that. And then we just say greeter.deploy. And we pass in the constructor value. In our case, hello hardhat. I might say hello shift, whatever. And then we wait for this to be deployed. And then we can go ahead and log out the address for this uh, deployment. So let's go ahead and deploy this. And what we should see is that we should see some logging, because our Ethereum node is going to log any time an interaction happens. So we should say npx hardhat run scripts slash deploy.js. And we see that oh, it looks like it was deployed, but we don't have any logging for whatever reason. Um, so we've deployed our, our contract. That's interesting. But let's go ahead and build a quick um, ERC20 token, a token. And we want to go ahead and build an interface on top of that. To do that, I'm going to create a file called token.soul. In token.soul, I'm going to write the smallest uh, smart contract you've probably ever seen. Here we have created a, a, a token and basically 10 lines of code. Um, what we're basically doing, though, is inheriting something called the ERC20 standard, which basically defines a bunch of functions and stuff that we can just start using. And we can start using not only in our contract, but we can use um, that are inherited from contracts that we can't see. So we have functions like mint. We have functions like transfer. So like mint means we want to go ahead and mint these tokens. Transfer means we want to send these tokens to someone else. Um, what we're basically doing here is taking in two values to the constructor. We want to say, what's this token name and what's the token symbol? And we're then going to go ahead and mint 100,000 of these tokens. And I'm, I'm saying 100,000 times 10 to the 18th power because most of these ERC20 tokens have 18 decimals. So we've created our contract. 
Let's go ahead and compile this um, and deploy it. So to deploy, we basically want to do the same thing that we did here, except we want to deploy from token. So here we have uh, the same thing where we're calling uh, git contract factory ND token, um, which is, if you go here to token, we call that ND token here. So we uh, go ahead and get a reference to that contract. Um, we you know, do all the same stuff. The, only, the, the main difference is that in our constructor, we're calling this the Natter Dabit token and we're giving it the symbol of NDT. So let's go ahead and deploy uh, this token. And I'm gonna go ahead and restart the node. And let's go ahead and deploy. All right, so it looks like we have deployed successfully. So we now have our two different addresses. So let's go ahead and um, let's go ahead and import the token into our wallet, okay? So the way I can do that is I can, uh, and I have maybe four or five minutes left, so I know we're over on time, but I'm trying to make this quick. So I have this private key that I can go ahead and import in my, into my project. So what I wanna do is, uh, or I, I can actually import this into my uh, wallet, I mean. So I'm gonna go here, I have this Ethereum wallet, and go ahead and log in. And I have uh, a network to choose from. So I can say, I wanna be on Ethereum mainnet or I wanna be on a testnet, but there's also a local host. So if you've ever written React or any of these web things, you're very, if you're a developer, you know what local host is, right? So we have a local host 8545. I can now say add token. And I'm gonna go ahead and copy this uh, token address here. And there's something going on there. Um, I can figure that out in just a second. But before we do that, I guess let's go ahead and um, import the, uh, the address. So I can go to um, import account. And there we have uh, 10,000 ETH. So now let's go ahead and try one more time to import this token. Hmm. No, it should be working. So I'm gonna have to, to see what's going on here. Live coding, it's always something, okay. Um, oh, I know the problem, okay. I, I know the problem 100%. So when I run npx hardhat, run scripts slash deploy.js, I actually need to specify we want to deploy to localhost. So I can say network, localhost, boom. Now we can go ahead and import the token. And it's still, for some reason, not working. So let's try this one more time. <laughs> oh, okay. There we go. So now we can say next, next, and we now have uh, 100,000 ND tokens. So we're basically rich. So, yeah. Um, so now that we have our token, let's go ahead and, and use that token in our front end because I'm a full stack developer and I'm not interested unless I can build a front end for it. So I'm gonna go to my React app. And the first thing I'm interested in is like, how are we gonna know if this person has an Ethereum wallet? So let's detect their wallet and we can do that in like just a handful of lines of code. So what I wanna do is have a function that says, I want to go ahead and look for a variable called window.ethereum. And if someone has a wallet installed, you'll have this Ethereum variable available in the scope. And I wanna go ahead and request their accounts and then I'm gonna log them out. So we do that in these three lines of code. And then I can just say, I want to have now a button that calls that. And now we can run npm start. And we will go ahead and open the inspector because I'm gonna be using the inspector. So let's go ahead and connect our wallet. So I see I have this button here, it's really beautiful. Click it. We can now see, boom, we now have our wallet. And not only that, but we're also gonna log out the uh, accounts array for all the, the addresses that we've authorized. The next thing we wanna do is read the accounts um, tokens, and then um, we can log those out. 
So I can say I want to get token balance. Um, don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to kind of speed through this. But basically, we're going to connect the wallet. We're going to create something called a provider, which is kind of like almost, uh, you could think of it as like a GraphQL client, where you have this client where you configure it, and then you make requests to the blockchain network. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and get the balance. And we're going to do the same thing for uh, sending a token. And um, again, I'm not going to walk through all this code because I'm running uh, low on time. But what we're doing here is we want to provide the account address that we want to send, the amount of tokens we want to send, and we want to go ahead and um, call contract.transfer. We're basically calling a function on the contract. And then we're going to have three buttons, and then we're going to be done. So I'm going to have a button for sending the coins and a button for getting the balance. And I'm going to refresh, and I'm going to go ahead and do my imports. So here we're going to have, um, oops. Here we're going to go ahead and get the contract address. And I'm going to go ahead and open one more account and con copy that address and go here. And here we're going to paste that in. All right. And then we're going to be done. So now we can click uh, Get Balance. We see that we have a balance of 10,000 tokens. We want to send coins. And we click Confirm. And then we say, get balance again. We now have 99,000 99, because we've sent 10,000 to someone else. And uh, that's it. I don't want to go on any longer. I'm way over already. Um, anyway, so I hope you enjoyed that. Um, if you want to get, continue like, learning about this stuff, there's Scaffold ETH, which is like a getting started boilerplate with like, hundreds of like, projects that you can play around with. Um, Anchor is a good framework if you want to build on Solana. Um, the Complete Guide to Full Stack Ethereum Development is something I've written that's been read in some form or another like over a quarter million times. That'll get you up and running. And uh, my favorite quote is uh, my favorite, from my favorite artist called I'm a businessman. I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm not a businessman. I'm a business comma man. And I think that like Web3 allows everyone, if they choose to, to become a business instead of um, allowing other people to create businesses on top of them. So that's it. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, hand together for Nada Dabitz.